Well, another Monday is here, and this one is a little video that I put together on uh, reviewing AC system stuff. Just some basic principles for the review for the ones of you guys that are a little more knowledgeable, and you know, for some people that just want to learn some new stuff, this won't hurt them either. And so, let's get started on this. All right. So you're got to know your you know the new refrigerant. I'm not going to talk a lot about that this time. Is the R1234 YFO, um, and it boils at uh, minus 22 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which that's when it turns from a vapor, uh, I mean from a liquid to a vapor. Um, all right, you got your uh, R134 that we're used to, that's in the light blue bottle, and it boils at minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit, more or less. And so it actually works a little bit better than R1234. There was some concerns about R1234 being flammable. Um, the annoying thing about R1234 is how expensive it is. And anybody that's ever done any air conditioners repairs knows just how hard some of these uh, leaks can be to find. There was a friend of mine that contacted me about, <clears throat> I don't know, about a week and a half ago and he said his son had a vehicle that would lose its refrigerant once a month. Uh, he lives way off up north here. And I said, well, somebody needs to put some dye in there because you'll usually find it if you put some good dye in there and get you a black light. And he said, well, two shops have done that and they can't find the leak, you know. And uh, we have basically looked for leaks that we didn't find under the hood when we were using dye. And then whenever we turned on the air conditioner and let it start dripping, you'd see dye coming out of the evaporator drain. I don't know what the deal is with the one he was talking about. But the simple fact is when you've got a little bitty leak in an AC system, it's just no bigger. We had one one time on a van. It was losing its refrigerant charge every two days. And we found a place back there using soap bubbles and nitrogen and all that. And we would squirt that soapy water on there and it would make a little bubble about an eighth of an inch in diameter. And it would take it a full minute to blow that little bubble up to an eighth of an inch and then it would pop. That's the only leak that thing had and it would remove, it would empty the refrigerant enough to where the AC wouldn't cool within two days. Now, if it's only leaking uh, that refrigerant out of there once a month, you can see how difficult that's going to be to find. Anybody that's ever done a lot of leak finding work on air conditioners will tell you just how difficult that is to do. And, and anybody, you know, you've experienced it, nobody has to tell you. Um, but uh, anyway, let's move on here and talk a little bit about this. Um, one of the things you don't ever need to do is vent refrigerant to the atmosphere. That is dreadfully illegal. It's not a good idea to do it anyway, and uh, you know the EPA is watching for people doing that, and uh, they will uh, make you pay a fine. You know, and uh, occasionally if you've got if one springs a leak, you can't really help that. Uh, but if you're doing your work by uh, venting the refrigerant uh, on purpose to empty the system instead of pumping it out the way you're supposed to, you really need uh, equipment to pump it out and, and trap it. Uh, the machine that we used when I was at the college over there was a machine that I bought about 20 years ago for like $4,500. You don't really have to spend that much on one necessarily. There are some units you can use to pump the refrigerant out of there safely and to save it. When liquid boils, it, always wear safety glasses too because if this refrigerant freezes your eyeball, you don't see out of that eyeball anymore. So be, wear safety glasses and be smart. When liquid boils, it absorbs heat. Since refrigerant boils at below zero, it causes the evaporator to get very cold. That bullet point doesn't need to be there, sorry about that. So how do we take advantage of that to make us cool and dry? The fixed orifice system is what we've got right here. That's a little fixed orifice. Believe it or not, there were uh, some manufacturers who were making orifice. It looks almost exactly like that it was a variable orifice. I learned about it at the Mobile Air Conditioning Society one time when I went up there to write an article. Um, but and I got video of that somewhere of the, on the screen how they were showing it worked, you know, but uh, I don't know which vehicles have that, but I didn't notice it. Um, but the compressor is the heart of it. It's the pump, you know, and this is the discharge line. It's pumping the refrigerant out, and it, it gets rid of the heat in here, you know, so there's a fan blowing across it. And then as it comes up through here, it goes to that orifice. That orifice turns it into a low-pressure liquid, and as it goes through here, it's evaporating and turning into a uh, vapor, and any time water or any other stuff evaporates, it turns into a vapor that absorbs heat. You might even notice when something like alcohol, uh, when you get it on your hand and you wave your hand around, or gasoline, 
it makes your hand feel cool because it's evaporating quickly and absorbing the heat out of your skin. Uh, when you get out of the swimming pool, you know, and the wind is blowing a little bit, if it's during this time of year when it's starting to be, get fall, um, incidentally it's like uh, right now it's 76 degrees here, it's really nice in Alabama. But the long and the short of it is, you get out of the pool or get out of the shower or in a cool room, when that water is evaporating off your skin, it makes you feel cold. Well, this is the AC accumulator, and you know, you've seen these things, you know what they look like. Now remember, fixed orifice systems will have an accumulator. That's how that works. The accumulator is going to be on the low pressure side of the system between the evaporator and the compressor. Alright, let's look at the difference on that. The TXV system, the expansion valve system, is going to have a receiver dryer that's in the high pressure side of the system, so it's going to be different. All right, now some of the expansion valves look like this one right here. But you notice they've still got that same little uh, diaphragm on there. And what they do is it's measuring the temperature of the low, I mean of the suction, uh, so that it can determine, we'll see there, that's where it's got that little temperature probe. It's measuring the temperature so it can regulate, that's a variable orifice, and it regulates the flow of refrigerant uh, through the evaporator. Um, you know, they, you know, well, again, thermal expansion valves will always have a receiver dryer. I worked on air conditioners for years before I even thought about that. Uh, but when I started teaching it about 20 years ago, I realized, you know, that's one of the things that you always have. If it's got a receiver dryer, you're going to have an expansion valve. If it's got an accumulator, you're going to have an orifice. Now, some of the vans have got an air conditioning system in the back, back there, that uses the same refrigerator, same compressor and everything. You have a separate evaporator, and those will use, even if you've got a fixed orifice in the front, the vans with the AC in the back, a lot of the time, will have an expansion valve. And so keep that in mind, too, when you're troubleshooting. Um, incidentally, when you're putting uh, oil charge in there, you've got to have a certain amount of oil charge, because the way a compressor gets lubricated, it's kind of like a chainsaw. The refrigerant oil is going to mix with the refrigerant and go through the compressor to keep it lubricated. And when we used to do conversions from 12 to 134 years ago, if you used, if you had to put oil in there that was compatible with 134 because the, the 12 R12 oil that was used with that wasn't compatible. And so what it would do is it would lock the compressor up if you didn't put the right kind of oil in there. You know, and uh, all right, so let's move out here. Now uh, here's the diagram that's got a closer look to it. A thermal expansion valve, a variable orifice system and the liquid becomes low pressure liquid right there at that and the sensing tube. Now I don't know, Volkswagen Rabbits that had this expansion valve on them and some of the other vehicles do too I suppose. There's a screen in that and the reason the screen's in there is if this thing here comes apart and some of the desiccant starts scattering through the system that screen would keep it from getting into the evaporator and furthermore would keep it from making it all the way to the compressor. That screen on that one it's a little screen, you could pull it off, we would find it stopped up with crud sometimes and we'd have to replace the receiver dryer on Volkswagen Rabbits when I worked at a dealer there in the early 80s. Um, the sensing tube reacts to the suction temperature, changes the size of the liquid orifice to prevent evaporator freezing. The receiver dryer contains desiccant and removes small amounts of moisture from the refrigerant on the high pressure side. It also stores a little bit of oil in there, which is what happens in the accumulator too. On the fixed orifice system, the TXV, is absent and the orifice is fixed, then you got this big accumulator right here. Uh, and that's a blower motor blowing through there, and then this is air coming in through the front. There's a fan there that's not pictured here. Um, you might notice that driving down the road, if you're paying attention, if you've got your air conditioner on, if you're driving down the road, you're, uh, when you hit about 45 miles an hour on some of the vehicles I was familiar with, particularly Tauruses and stuff like that, the radiator cooling fan would shut down because you had enough air coming through the, uh, the evaporator because of road feed, you know, and where you didn't really need the fan. Although some of them the fan will keep running anyway, and they got the fans with multiple speeds and all that. Um, but anyway, while mixing the oil in the refrigerant to lube the compressor, uh, like the fuel oil mix lubricates the chainsaw. And that's basically what I was talking about earlier. Now the accumulator and dryer are two different critters, but they basically do the same job. Only one of them is on the low side of the system, the other is on the high side. Desiccant bag here, the little screen here, there's a tiny little hole right there, because you might notice that this suction going out in the compressor, it gets only gas, it doesn't get any liquid 
This thing is supposed to keep that from getting liquid. Now there is a little bit of oil in the refrigerant that are puddled up together in here. Uh, as a matter of fact, there will be oil in the uh, refrigerant in there mixed together sort of in a way like a, you know, shaking up a Dr. Pepper or a Coke or something. And that's why sometimes after you completely, you think you've got all the refrigerant out of the system with your machine, if you turn the machine off and walk away for a little while, you'll see pressure has come back up. Because refrigerant is bubbling out of this, all of this in here. But that little hole right there is supposed to grab a little bit of oil through that screen and it pulls it out there and it you know, travels with the refrigerant and the compressor and lubricates those pistons in the compressor that's really important. Because that compressor is really doing some heavy duty work. Now, Ford has got something called, uh, when the compressor is mounted low, uh, they've got a strategy uh, called CASS, where whenever you're spinning the engine over, it energizes the compressor and starts moving those pistons to work any oil out of there slowly that may have been settled into the compressor. Because if the compressor kicks in real hard whenever there's oil in there, you know, it might slug it and cause some kind of, you know, damage to the compressor. Ford was concerned about it. They got a compressor anti-slugging strategy, a CASS, in case you weren't familiar with that. Now, the inlet, you know, you might notice it goes through here and it goes through this desiccant and these, there's a filter on either side of that desiccant, usually metal with holes in it, and this desiccant is kind of like the little stuff that you see in the bottle of pills, you know. Anyway, the, it pulls that out of there. This is, this is actually liquid because uh, it's on the liquid line side and it goes to the from here to the uh, thermal expansion valve. So keep in mind how that thing is built. You see how it's about that much, that full of oil and that oil will have refrigerant mixed with it and all. Alright, so with vans with two evaporators may have a TXV and a fixed orifice. I showed you that little picture there. I talked about that earlier. Alright, so refrigerant flows through these. Your condenser, your discharge line, your expansion valve, your evaporator, your suction line. If you're thinking your condenser may be partially clogged up on the inside where that it's not doing its work really well, you know, it gets really hot whenever it's operating. If you can get your eyes on that condenser in a way where you can see the whole thing, you can spray water, just plain old cool water on that thing, and it should evaporate that water pretty quick because of the heat of that condenser. Now, if there's places where the water stays unevaporated, but there's other places where it dries off, then you, have, you can have an idea there's some clogging on the inside of the condenser. That will keep the AC from working the way it ought to. Uh, anyway, there's your little expansion valve there and your evaporator is what it looks like. Um, the expansion valve, if you've got both sides low, like if you've got one that's not cool and good, but you know it's got a full charge, and the low sides, low and the high side are both low, uh, then that's typically going to be an expansion valve, although on one Toyota Camry we put an expansion valve on it, and it gave us the same readings until we replace the evaporator. Don't usually have to do that. Usually the expansion valve is all you need. Alright, so this right here is something that started coming out in the mid-2000s on some Asian vehicle. I know Hyundai's have them. This is a subcooler. It looks like a condenser, but it's actually more than a condenser because of the way it's designed. You know, this little, you, you've seen these little desiccant bags you change out whenever you just screw the little top off and pull them out. Well, what you got to realize is this thing right here is a modulator, which acts also as a receiver dryer. This is a subcooler. It lets the refrigerant come in, and then it makes it switch over to this bottom part, and so that the liquid, when it comes out of this thing, is not hot. You notice how your liquid lands usually really, really hot, and it almost burn your hand. Well, on these right here, the liquid is cool, coming out of this subcooler, which looks just like a condenser, but you can't see what's going on inside of it unless somebody tells you. Now this was, a, this was something else I picked up by going to the uh, Mobile Air Conditioning Society convention several, day, several years in a row when I was writing for those people at Fraction Magazine. Um, now this right here, electrical stuff you got to deal with. you got fans, clutches, and switches. You know, you got your compressor clutch coil. And you got this. These right here need to be replaced as a pair. Um, and furthermore, in a lot of cases, it costs about as much to buy just the coil, just these both, I'm, I'm sorry, just these both parts of that clutch as it does to pay for a whole compressor on some vehicles. I usually replace the whole compressor anyway. Um, you know, there's, a, there's this laid out up here. Make sure you don't forget any of these. There's the little shims where you set the air gap. We'll talk about that in a little bit. 
And then you got relays and controls. Your condenser fan is really important. Remember how I told you to check the condenser, condenser fan? You can lay it on the bench, get a battery, and act like you were going to hook it up to run, but use a test light for one of your leads. So that test light will come on. And while that test light's on, while you've got it hooked up in series with that fan and a battery, you turn that fan really slow. If that test light ever goes off, that fan's junk. That is a go, no go test. If it fails that test, you're done. All right. Yeah, and then you got your get you got your switches, high pressure switch, low pressure switch, and you got your AC clutch right here. Uh, and then you got your own switch. Now this right here is very simple. This is a very very simple schematic, and you're probably not going to see anything quite like this on a car. But this is just sort of giving you an overview of what you got going on here. And uh, these pressure switches are usually wired in series so that if either one of them opens, it kills the compressor. More modern wiring will have a PCM or an amplifier up there. Uh, you got your clutch relay control. You got your low pressure switch. Now, Ford's, as peculiar as that seems back in the day, back in the uh, 90s, well, earlier 90s uh, and 80s and all, they had. Uh, the normally closed part of the relay carrying the compressor and when you floorboarded the accelerator uh, the PCM would energize that relay and it would cause the compressor to drop out. I had a Volkswagen diesel rabbit one time and, uh, the, and those things right there never were really all that powerful and if the air conditioner was on it was it even took more power away from you. And so what I did, I don't know if you remember the little switches on the injector pump that was there so that they helped you, uh, they operated the shift light and I, I was, uh, it's an 83 model, and it had those switches on there. And I took one of those switches, though, I'd open the, the high-end throttle switch, and I wired that thing up, connected it to a relay, just like Ford would do, so that that little switch on the injector pump would drop the compressor clutch when I really accelerated. So if I accelerated good and hard, uh, it would give me an extra little zoom in the summertime because that switch would open that relay, or would energize a relay, which was pulling the compressor through the normally closed contacts and that helped me get a little more zoom out of that thing when you're going into traffic on a diesel rabbit like that you know unless you've modified it I've talked about that a little bit too but anyway uh, you got a high pressure switch here low pressure switch here uh, on this one here I kind of drew that schematic so they're separate but a lot of times they're still wired in series uh, even if it's going to the PCM on Jeeps it's like that on today's vehicles, the pressure switches are sending a signal to a controller, either an amplifier or a PCM. Amplifiers are really popular on Asian cars and European cars. The amplifier is just a little computer that takes input and controls the compressor clutch and helps keep the evaporator from icing up and all that kind of stuff. You know, Ford tends to put that into that. Now, General Motors likes to have what they call a, a programmer, you know, especially if they got automatic temperature control and all that. Now, uh, done a video on a Buick that I fought with one time that the uh, cooling fan wouldn't come on and it was a strange relationship between the gym module and the PCM and the, I mean, I'm sorry, the body control and the, uh, and the PCM and the uh, AC module. That's another story. Some high pressure AC sending units have three wires and send actual pressure readings to their controllers that have reference voltage and they'll basically have a analog uh, signal. PCM AC input 2000 F-150. This is the way this one's wired up. You notice how these wires, these are in series. This high pressure switch opens at 445 and closes at 260. And this low pressure switch on this one opens at 24 and a half and closes at 43 and a half. See, so there's a differential between when they open and when they close. It's not an instant switch, right? Now this switch directly feeds power to the PCM on pin 41. And then the PCM decides when to engage the AC clutch. I'll show you that on the next slide. But uh, you might even notice if you're watching the gauges on the Ford, if it gets down below 24.5, it'll turn off the compressor and it'll climb back up. And then until it hits 43 and a half, it'll, it won't click it back on. If you've got a cold day or a low refrigerant charge, you'll wind up with a short cycling compressor because of this low pressure switch. That one right there will cut it off if the, uh, you know, whenever you're looking... Uh, at one, you need to make sure that if you're fighting one that doesn't cool right, you need to pull the, and sometimes you've got to pull a radiator loose and tilt it back to look down in between the radiator and the condenser because a lot of the straw and everything that in these fields on these pickups will go right through that radiator and stop. When, I mean, I'm sorry, they'll go right through the condenser and they'll stop in front of the radiator. 
and that will keep airflow from going through there good. Uh, if somebody has put an aftermarket fan on there that came without a connector, they may hook the wires up backwards and it may be blowing instead of pulling. And you can put a piece of newspaper up there and tell what's going on there. Um, so that's important too. Sometimes I've actually taken the condenser and washed it off with high pressure. You've got to be careful because if you hit it from an angle, you're bending the little fins. But I've washed the condenser and got the dirt and crud out of it that you couldn't tell was there. And it had to, made it, had to make a big difference on the way it goes. Uh, on some of these uh, Volkswagens and other vehicles too. Alright, so PCM AC output, there you go, you got a diode here, I've talked about that before. That keeps this compressor, when you turn the compressor off and that uh, magnetic field collapses, that sweeping across those windings will create a spike that will go places and it's going to find a place to go usually where you don't want it to. And so that's what that diode is there for. Uh, and you're going to be, look long and hard before you find an AC compressor clutch system in any vehicle of any make or model that doesn't have a diode in there. Relays have got little clamping resistors or diodes in there for, uh, that's wired up parallel with a coil on those to keep those relays from spiking the con engine controllers and other uh, electronic boxes because that spike is not friendly to those electronics. It finds places to go to destroy things. There's your wide open throttle relay. You might notice uh, that one right there uh, is basically wired up so that they're calling it a watt relay. That's what they call it on the older Ford. This schematic has that misnamed. Uh, that's just the AC clutch relay actually. If it was a wide open throttle relay, this wire would be coming off of no, no pin number four on there. All right, there's your blower control. That's not too complicated. To, uh, but we'll, I would, what you will notice most of the time is the blower uh, the blower motor has got power going to it all the time and the ground is fed to it through these resistors. If it's going through all three of them to get in the blower, the blower will run slow. If it goes through two, it runs a little higher. And whenever it's fed directly, in other words, if that relay energizes and pulls it, you know, power straight to it, well, on this one, that's not like a Chevrolet, I'm sorry, it actually bypasses all of those resistors in high when you put it on high, you see. And, uh, I noticed I got this out of a, a shop manual, but I don't like the way this thing is drawn. Uh, let's see, let me look at that for a second, make sure I know what I'm talking about. All right, now that one right there is a ground. Okay, yeah, if you put it on high, the ground is going to go straight to that. But I don't like the way that's drawn even now. Boy, they screwed that up when they drew it, and I didn't even catch that when I was putting that slide together. Because when you put this on high, it looks like it's going through all three of them. Um, and low is going straight to it. They drew that darn thing backwards. They put low where high was supposed to be. In high. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's embarrassing. I didn't draw the schematic. All I did was take it out of the shop manual. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. When you get it looking at stuff, you find things. I just discovered that right now. Okay, when you have a fan vibrations, you get these blowers with this junk in there. That's kind of funny. This friend of mine came to me and he said, oh, my daddy shakes when I turn my blower on high. So we pulled his blower out and it looked like it had old, some rotten dish rag in there. Somebody had run through the laundry and it, the bleach had eaten it up. And I don't know, he never still knows how that got in there. But if you find that, in a worst case scenario, you'll find a dead animal in there like a lizard or something. You usually have a smell when that comes out. Well, you got your doors and the dash. That changes from car to car. But basically, uh, back in the day, they used to have these little... Uh, See these little uh, motors right here, these vacuum motors that had two, they could have, they would only have like two positions to go through. Uh, and then you had a vacuum reservoir with a check valve, this came from the intake manifold. When that check valve goes bad on one of those that's got that check valve, and sometimes the check valve will be built into the reservoir, you get on that thing really hard and your uh, air conditioner goes to defrost, that's going to be this, this check valve right here, or a leak somewhere. A leak somewhere can cause that too. But the check valve is the easiest fix for that. Um, but anyway, if you have that, look for leaks in all this system. Heck, I've even pumped smoke through it before looking for those leaks whenever I realized it wasn't this, it was something else. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, there's your blend door right there. When that blend, blend door closes off, you're getting all cool air. And whenever it comes up part way, you're getting some warm air and some cool air. But this is always going to dry the air out. Because the compressor is typically going to be running if you're on defrost or anything like that, particularly. 
in order to control the blend door more precisely though where you can stop it right where you want it to even on the lower end units you'll basically you find yourself looking at solid state blend door actuators you know I had a plane I had a little 98 Ranger uh, trainer vehicle uh, and it was a base truck there was nothing special about it. it had crank up windows and all that but you'll find blend door actuators in there that are operated by a potentiometer that's in the control head and the reason for that is they want to be able to, you want to be able to stop that blend door just anywhere you want to anywhere throughout its length now the little gears in those doors and a lot of the doors Chevrolet are really bad to do that uh, but they're not the only ones those little gears like to break off in those doors and they'll go pop 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 you know trying to move the door where they're supposed to go just drive you up the wall until you put one in there uh, but very few vehicles still use vacuum especially for their blend doors. Most of them have got electronic actuators now. This is a funny story. There was this Buick, this uh, 85 Buick Riviera that came in there. And it had one of these touch screens right here like you're seeing on the dash, in the middle of the dash. You can look that up. It was a CRT touch screen. And everything you did on the dash, radio and everything else, was right there in that touch screen. You just had to select what function you wanted. I've never seen one of those darn things before. And I took this 44-year-old student that was working with me, and I said, Jerry, go in there and turn the air conditioner on. Let's see if the clutch kicks in. So he sat down in the car for a while. He's rubbing his face and all that, trying to figure something out. And then he gets out, and he says, I don't know how to turn on the air conditioner. I said, oh, come on, Jerry. you got to be smarter than that. And I went and sat down in that thing, <laughs> and I was rubbing my face just like he was for a little bit. And then finally I figured out what I needed to do. But that's a funny little story. But you got to know how to turn the air conditioner on if you're going to be able to fix it anyway. If you don't know how to turn the air conditioner on, then some, that sounds stupid, but on some cars they got funky ways of doing things that you may not be used to. The person that drives it every day will know, but you won't. Remember the story about the Geo Tracker that didn't have the button on the dash? All right. Now the next thing, we're working on the AC because it doesn't cool well or doesn't cool at all, so we turn on the AC and see, the compre see if the compressor will kick in. I want to know if the compressor will kick in. It may take a few seconds, for the PCM to turn it on, so be patient. Well, if it doesn't run, we're going to find the fittings. And I've got a lot of the manufacturers that put the fittings right there where they're easy to get to. The low side ports usually on the suction side or the of the or on the accumulator, and the high side tends to be on the discharge line between the compressor and the condenser. The high side is the larger port on R134. Now, the crazy thing I've seen Jaguars that had it behind the driver's side wheel underneath the car. I don't know why they put one of those under there. All right, so if it doesn't run, check the gas. Make sure that the gas is not mixed. I've seen this. It's came from a shop. Picture I took in the shop. R134, 23%. R12, 76%. What in the world was this about? This is an identifier. Uh, you see Peter Call at Neutronics for one of these. You know, he'll sell you one. They're kind of pricey, but they're needful. All right, so this is a little box you can buy for not all that much money. Uh, and you're going to see with things. I would use this special box to pump it into a bottle. It needs to be in a gray with a yellow top. If it's contaminated, that's what we pump this out with, but you can use it for your other refrigerant too if you had a sort of a low budget outfit. Check for static pressure. There's no reliable numbers for static pressure. Uh, if the pressure is really low, it's a good bet the system's low on juice, and on most of the system, the compressor won't even engage if the low pressure cutout switch is reading less than 24 pounds. If there's no pressure, do a vacuum and check and see if it'll hold vacuum for a few minutes. A full vacuum is 30 inches of mercury on the gauge when you get it pulled. All right. If there is pressure, use the recycler to recover the gas, provided it was the right kind of gas. Notice how much came out, compare it to specs, pay attention to how much oil was extracted in your little oil bottle over here, and then add the right amount of refrigerant and oil back. If it still won't run with a full charge, we're going to pull the AC relay. We're going to put a test light right there to see if we're getting a ground through here. If we don't get a ground through here, see there's when you pull that. If you don't get a ground through here, you're going to find out. You can also check AC clutch relay output with a test light if you go underneath there. Okay. So if the test light stays dark, the compressor clutch is likely burned out, but don't forget to check the wire into the ground. With a relay removed and the AC on, you ought to have two powers and two grounds showing at the relay with a two-way talking scan tool. You can tell the PCM to turn on the AC clutch relay to check and see if it happens. If it cools fine and it stops after you drive it a while, bump the clutch. If it kicks in, you need to set the air gap. Not that difficult. Ain't rocket science. 
you got to pay attention to your scan tool readings and see if they match up with these if you've got an evaporator that's freezing up. That's really important too. Alright, so don't forget to check the fuses and the cutout switches and the pin fit and all that kind of stuff. We're coming up on the end. Now we're going to do this. This is a little thing. You can save the image if you want to. 